For most of our nation's history, black and white members of the armed forces were anything but equal. Then in 1948, a new law brought segregation to an end. David Martin looks back at the long and painful battle for equality in uniform. Nothing would have kept me from being with you this evening. Because I and so many other men and women of color who have served this nation in uniform owe so much to President Harry S. Truman and to Executive Order 9981. The late Colin Powell was only 11 years old in 1948 when President Truman issued the executive order ending segregation in the armed forces. There shall be equality of treatment and opportunities for all persons in the armed services without regard to race, creed, or color. But first, the man from Independence, Missouri, had to overcome his upbringing. Both of my grandparents, previous to the war between the states, owned slaves. And my mother died an unreconstructed rebel. This is a, an example from 1939. Kurt Graham, director of the Truman Library, says the archives contain handwritten examples of his racist views. He says, uh, I went up to the Metropolitan by myself and saw men about town. It is a very funny show. The N-word steals the screen. This is how he thinks. Yeah, it had no hesitation, no compunction about using a racial epithet like that. Six years later, as World War II entered its final agony, Truman was thrust into the presidency by the sudden death of Franklin Roosevelt and found himself the commander in chief of two armies one black and one white. The war was a watershed moment in the process of segregation. Charles Bowery, director of the Army's Center for Military History, says the one million African Americans who fought for freedom in uniform while being denied it at home exposed the hypocrisy of segregation. It forwarded the civil rights movement because of the massive scale of service of African Americans in uniform, it just could not be ignored. You could not ignore the bravery of African Americans. And Truman could not ignore the despicable treatment of black veterans like Isaac Woodard. Isaac Woodard is an African American soldier who comes home from the war and he's dragged from a bus by South Carolina police and beaten so severely that he permanently loses his sight. And Truman, I think, just says that's enough. Did you do anything about it? He instructed the Justice Department to investigate. An all-white jury acquitted the defendants, and life went on in South Carolina. Hmm. But Harry Truman uh, was not going to let that stand. Speaking from the Lincoln Memorial, Truman became the first president ever to address the NAACP. There is no justifiable reason for discrimination because of ancestry, or religion, or race, or color. Risky politics for a president seeking a second term. He has enraged the South with his liberal civil rights platform. What was his political future in 1948? He was on the ropes. He was seen to be someone who likely was not going to win re-election. Days after he was nominated, Truman issued the order to end segregation in the military. What was the, the Army's reaction to this order? The Army's reaction, particularly in its leadership, was stridently against the executive order. Truman appointed a committee headed by Charles Fahey to enforce the order. Records show its staff director warning Fahey the Army intends to do as little as possible and might have gotten away with it except for a black civilian who worked at the Pentagon. An individual with deep understanding of the Army's personnel practices. <laughs> He's the Fahey Committee's deep throat. That's a way to describe it, yes. Roy Davenport is one of history's hidden figures. Using his inside knowledge to show the Fahey Committee, the Army's response for desegregation wasn't worth the paper it was written on. What really turns the coin is the Korean War. Desegregation begins in foxholes in Korea. With all-white combat units retreating in the face of the North Korean onslaught, black soldiers were sent in to fight alongside whites. What happens is that these units 
turn the tide. And the army in Korea is on a path to integration because they have finally and completely disproven this idea that black soldiers cannot be trusted alongside white soldiers. So wars are a forcing mechanism. They are. So the next war is Vietnam. Yes. As the buildup in Vietnam was beginning and the civil rights movement reaching critical mass, Joe Anderson was a cadet at West Point. Did you ever wonder, what am I doing here? I absolutely wondered why I was at the academy when all of our people of black heritage were sitting at encounters and fighting uh, to be treated fairly in the United States. James Fowler, one of only six black colonels in the entire army at the time, gave him this advice. He said to me, Joe, we have a lot of people that can sit in encounters. We don't have a lot of people that can get through West Point. That's your job. As he entered his senior year, Anderson was denied a leadership position in the Corps of Cadets. My view is that the Academy in 1964 was not ready to have African Americans uh, demonstrate significant leadership in the parades and that kind of thing. Hold up. Hey, sir! Two years after graduating, Anderson became arguably the best known soldier, black or white, in the entire Army. Lieutenant Anderson, 24. Leader of the Anderson Platoon, an Oscar and Emmy winning documentary which aired on CBS. It was probably the first time that America had seen an African American in leadership in combat. Anderson's platoon showed the country what the Army had learned in Korea. In combat, it's about who can get them home safe. But in the rear areas, race still mattered. Black soldiers were not going to take the same kind of treatment that they had taken in civilian life. Hank Thomas is a lion in the winter of his years. But at the age of 19, he was one of the original Freedom Riders. A firebomb was thrown through the back window of the bus. And when I was getting off the bus, I was attacked again physically. Each physical blow was a badge of honor. Sure, he was about to be drafted into the Army for his troublemaking, Thomas volunteered to become a medic and was sent to Vietnam. The commanding officer was a captain from Mississippi, and the supply sergeant was a redneck from Mississippi. Did they use Confederate symbols? There was a group of soldiers in my outfit who flew the Confederate flag. I towed a flag down and dared anyone to put it up again. Did you have any run-ins with that redneck supply sergeant? The black soldiers came to me and said uh, the sergeant uh, was not giving them new boots. So I went over to the supply shack, threatened to whip his butt. I almost got court-martialed for it, uh, but I got the boots and the equipment for the black soldiers. After Vietnam, the U.S. abandoned the draft and created an all-volunteer force, which attracted recruits by offering better pay and benefits. What it did was dramatically increase the number of African Americans who raised their hand to serve. Because I was 17, my mother had to sign for me uh, to go in, so 41 and a half years later, here I sit. Now a lieutenant general, Dimitri Henry joined the Marines in 1981. Did you experience anything that felt like discrimination as you were coming up through the enlisted ranks? I would call it points where individuals uh, would, would show their disdain for someone who looked like me. So how did they express their disdain? At a typical name calling. The N-word? Yes. How did you react? I chose not to react. If you're going to um, allow someone else to control your emotions, then you've already lost. While Henry was still a sergeant, Colin, Welcome, sir. Colin Powell became the first black chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. During the first Gulf War against Iraq, Powell showed the nation a black general in charge. Our strategy to go after this army is very, very simple. First, we're going to cut it off, and then we're going to kill it. But Dimitri Henry says he still feels judged by the color of his skin. It helps me to focus more uh, because I understand what uh, is being thought about me and, and uh, what people may decide to do just based solely on what I look like. That sounds like a I'll show them attitude. 
unfortunately, I think that's exactly what it is. It's a survival type of uh, tool. Henry survived to become the director of intelligence for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, okay. another first for black Americans in uniform. That uh, happened on the backs and shoulders of uh, others that have gone before, and it just builds and builds and builds. Mr. Secretary, good morning, David. The most obvious result of the forces Harry Truman set in motion 75 years ago is Lloyd Austin, the first African-American defense secretary. Would you be in this job without that order? Probably not. Uh, probably not. In the two years he's been in the job, Austin has more than doubled the number of black three- and four-star generals and admirals, from 10 to 22. That's a dramatic change. Mm -hmm. Did you select these generals because they were the best person for the job? Or did you select them because they are African-American? We selected them because they're the best people for the job. It's been 75 years since Truman issued his executive order. Is there equal treatment and opportunity in the armed forces? If you ever stopped striving to achieve uh, that goal of uh, equal opportunity and equal treatment, I think then you'll begin to slide backwards.